Well, this morning we're going to talk about God's mandate for fatherhood. Now, I'm not much of a, I don't have a whole lot of experience under my belt. Oh, by the way, a lot of kids, you're more than welcome to go to a kid's church, okay? Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience um, in being a father because I only have a 13-month-old, so you might be wondering, why am I speaking on fatherhood if I don't have so much experience under my belt? Well, I had two options. One was motherhood, and one was fatherhood. So I left motherhood to Sam, and I decided to take on fatherhood, all right, because I have nothing, no knowledge of motherhood at all, so. Um, anyway, so as we get into the, the text this morning, I want to begin by drawing our attention to understanding the importance of children. Right? Before I can talk about what fatherhood is and what all that means, we have to understand how valuable and how important children are in our life or in our community. From a child's conception, society teaches us that it's nothing more than just a culmination of biological processes. It's nothing more than nature taking its course and you have a baby. The miracle of conception has been dismissed to becoming a biological process. And that mindset, that thought, the way we look at children from the very beginning of their life has translated into society as well. Now it's okay to have a one-night stand with someone and have a little mishap because in a morning you can get rid of it. Or if you're a parent who's trying to do the parent thing and, and throughout the time you feel as if, well, you know what, it's not for me. I don't want to be a parent. I don't want to be a dad or a mother anymore. And so what you do is you think it's okay to abandon your family or to abandon your child, and you walk out. And I really believe that mindset is ingrained in us from the very beginning of a child's life. The miracle of conception has been dismissed as being something just something nature does. It just, it just happens. It's, it's natural. It's a, nature, it's a natural thing, nature doing its thing. And that mindset is carried over into society today. I want to go over just a couple of stats with you. Stats from the CDC, or the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, show that in 1980, 18% of children born in America were born out of wedlock. In 1990, it rose to 28%. In 2000, it rose even higher to 33%. And most recently, in 2009, 41% of the children born in America were born out of wedlock. And what I mean by that is they were born to an unmarried woman, most likely born into a, a situation where they didn't have a family structure, most likely that they didn't have a father who was present in their life. 41% of the children born in America did not, were born out of wedlock. That's staggering, staggering numbers when you think about it, 41%. And the more alarming thing is, is that since 1980, that number has just been climbing higher and higher, from 18% to now 41%. That should shock us. It should scare us. It should, it should really sober us. And I say all that to convey this truth, that in our society today, children are undervalued, undermined. They are seen as less than important. That's the way children are viewed today. And so be beginning this message, I want to simply state this thing, is that children are more than just a culmination of biological processes. Children are more than just nature taking its course. All throughout the Bible, there are revelations of how important children are in the sight of God. And I want to point out one scripture in particular, and it's in Psalm 139. It says, My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was even woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Psalm 139 gives a beautiful account of just how intimately, how detailed God goes about creating a child. It's not merely science. It's not merely a chance happening of events, but children are born and created in the heart and mind of God. From the very beginning, children are born and created in the heart and the mind of God the Father. That's where it starts. It doesn't start by some natural process here on earth. It begins in the heart and mind of God. 
Children are not just made. They are fearfully and wonderfully made by God the Father. And I want to give this perspective to you because I want you to understand so much that this is how important parenting is. Is that we understand that what we are given is a God-given gift from God. This is a God-given gift that we are entrusted as parents to take care of. Not just a culmination of random events, as your society would lead you to believe. So today I'm specifically addressing fathers. Now fathers play a critical role in the development of their children. Fathers are leaders. They're the ones that provide direction and vision for their family. Fathers are protectors. They're the ones that ensure that their family members are safe, protected, taken care of. Fathers provide their children a sense of confidence, a sense of acceptance, a sense of self-esteem, so that a children can proudly go about his life knowing that he has a father who instills love in him or her. But as you look through society over the last three or four decades, you can see a decline in the position of a father, just simply looking at television. I remember when I was growing up, I remember watching television shows back when, you know, in the 80s, where there were programs that depicted the father of being someone wise, someone with, with control, leadership, powerful, active. These are the images that I had when I, I saw the father in the 1980s. But you go forward beyond that, and it shows like Everybody Loves Raymond, The Simpsons, According to Jim. All of these shows have now completely changed the image of how a father is supposed to be. The father has gone from this powerful, active leader of his family to now a whiny, wimpy, puny, confused couch potato that just spends his time watching television all day long. That mindset has translated or has gone over to the society of our community today. Fathers are no longer held accountable to be fathers or to be amongst their family. They have left raising the children to the mothers while they go out and do what they want to do. After all, it's so much easier to pursue what you enjoy and what makes you happy than raising children. No argument there. That's what, our, that's what we've become. That's what our community has become. That's where we're at. A couple more statistics. As a result of these absent fathers, we have this. 63% of youths who commit suicide come from fatherless homes. 90% of all runaway and homeless children come from fatherless homes. 85% of children with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 85% of youths in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Fatherless boys and girls are twice as likely to drop out of high school, twice as likely to end up in jail, four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. While the rest of the world is laughing at comedy shows that show the father to be a deadbeat dad, there are countless lives of young children, the next generation, who are suffering, who are literally to the point of death because of their deadbeat dad. Let me say that again. While the rest of the world is laughing it up at shows that depict the father to be nothing but a lazy, inactive, invalid on a couch. There are countless lives of young people, the very next generation, who are literally suffering to the point of death because of their deadbeat dad. It's not so funny when you look at it in the real context, in its real picture. Children who are born in fatherless homes have self-esteem issues, and they grow up with questions asking, them, asking themselves, why did my father leave? Why is it so much, why did my father leave to the point where I don't even know who he is? I don't even know who my real father is. Am I really that messed up? Am I really that bad off that my dad didn't have the decency to introduce himself to me? And that question 
lingers with them through each and every moment of their life, even into adulthood. They are broken. They are hurting because they don't know why they are, gro- they are in this life and why they are alone. Why are they alone? And Satan very carefully, methodically, stings these people with this, this truth that you're not loved. Your dad didn't care about you. You're not loved. He abandoned you. And he continues to poke them with, this, with that truth. From the very beginning, God has held a special affection for the fatherless. In Exodus chapter 22, right after they had left Egypt, God made a special mandate or a command, and he tells them, look, you are not to take advantage of the widows and the orphans among you. You are not to take advantage of them. If you do, you die. God made it very clear that he had a special compassion, a special affection to these two groups of people in the Israelite community. And that carried on throughout their history and throughout into the New Testament. God has a heart for the widows and the orphans among us. So I say all this before I even get into what being a father is. I say all this to help you understand that if you are a father, or even if you are an individual who, are, who is around children, you have this responsibility of being an impact for God. And your response can alter the course of your, the child's life forever. This morning, you can choose to hear what I just said and be alarmed, be broken, be completely awakened to the reality of what fatherlessness does to people. And you can choose to embrace a role of being a father or, or at least being a father figure to someone. Or you can completely dismiss everything I just said and start thinking about lunch. You can make your choice. You, you have that right. But I do tell you this. Whatever choice you decide to make, it will have an impact in the lives of your children and the children around you. If you choose to be active or if you choose to be passive, whatever choice you make will impact forever the course of the children you have or the children around you. This morning, I want to examine the life of a father who had an opportunity to do something for his child. And we'll examine what he does. The story that we're about to go over is probably not a story that you would commonly consider as being a story about fatherhood. But yet I believe this is what God has for me to say. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open it up to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. And I'll read beginning in verse 21. Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Skip to verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. This may not have been a common passage for you to read in terms of ch- in fatherhood, but let me point out a few of the responsibilities men have as fathers over their children. This morning we begin with a man by the name of Jairus. He is a synagogue leader. 
That's important for us to know. He is a synagogue leader. A synagogue leader is someone who has a position in the synagogue or the local, over the local city or village and the responsibility of teaching the, the people there Jewish law, observing Jewish customs and traditions. A synagogue leader didn't just inherit that position by chance. A synagogue leader was someone who spent his life from a very early age on up into adulthood memorizing scriptures. He memorized the first five books of the Bible, or known as a Torah, and he knew that part of the Bible front and back. He was able to answer questions. He had the authority to teach people on the Torah. And this was a man who spent his life devoted to study, to memorization, to scripture. It was a man who had a, a great desire to be I mean, it, it took such great dedication that it motivated him to continue on until he reached this goal of being a synagogue leader. All this to say is that this is not just some mere chance that he became a synagogue ruler or a leader. It took him much of his life to build himself up to this position. You might relate. Some of you guys are in medical school. Some of you guys have been through pharmacy school or whatnot. You understand that much of your life was built in order to attain that position or attain that degree. Well, in the same manner, this man devoted all of his life to pursue and attain this position in society. And with this position, he had great notoriety. A synagogue leader was one among the, the Jews who was well respected. When he walked into the room, you noticed him. People would murmur and say, look, so-and-so has arrived. Jairus has arrived, the synagogue ruler. Or if there were main events in the Jewish custom, he would be the one that you would roll out the roll red carpet for, so to speak, because he was held in such high regard, high esteem. He was noticed. He was important, well-respected. In addition to that, he was a guy who had a great reputation, had a great network of friends. The people around him, the people he surrounded himself with, were likely Pharisees, synagogue, other synagogue rulers, um, priests. He built for him a great network of friends, a guy of great knowledge, great reputation, and great friends. He spent all of his life building this legacy, building this amazing life. So why does all of that matter? Well, one other common unifying belief about Pharisees, the priests, and synagogue rulers is that they despised Jesus Christ. Jairus was among many of other, other priests, Jews, uh, priests, uh, synagogue rulers, who hated Jesus. The sight of Jesus angered them because Jesus was seen by them as being a lunatic, a fanatic, who was misleading the people, the, the Jerusalem, the people of Jew, the Jew, Jewish people astray. He was teaching odd doctrines. He was not observing the traditions. He was saying and doing things that were leading the people astray. And the, the thing about it is, is he was claiming to be the son of God. And Jairus would not have anything to do with that. Synagogue rulers, priests, and Pharisees had nothing to do with that. They did not believe Jesus was the son of God. They despised Jesus. And instead of looking to find ways to be friends with him, throughout scripture you find that they are plotting, literally plotting to find ways of killing Jesus. They're looking to find ways of completely getting rid of him and just getting him back to the way things used to be. So keeping that in mind, understanding how Jairus felt about Jesus and how people around him felt about Jesus, that's what makes this verse so crazy. This is what makes this verse, opening up chapter 5, verse 21, and, and, and so on and so forth, so astounding, is that I know many people have come across the feet of Jesus and knelt at his feet. But I tell you, there is none more astounding who knelt at the feet of Jesus than Jairus. All right? This would be the equivalent of a member of the Al-Qaeda regime coming to the President of the United States and kneeling at his feet. It is unheard of. It would never happen. 
because such a thing would create great dissension amongst his community. People would disown Jairus. People, Jairus risked losing his job, risked losing his position and his notoriety. He risked losing it all when he took that plunge and knelt at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's what makes what he did so astounding, is that he, being a synagogue ruler, knelt at the feet of Christ. And we understand why he took such a ridiculous, crazy step in verse 23. He simply looks up at the Savior from the ground and he says, my daughter is dying. I need you to come home. I need you to come with me. My daughter is dying. I have no one else to turn to. I literally have no one else. And this is how desperate I am, that not only do I come to you being an enemy of my friends and of myself, I come to you humbled, kneeling at your feet, begging you, pleading with you to come back to save, rescue my dying daughter. This is the reason Jairus risked it all. This is the reason Jairus risked his job, his position, his reputation, his friends. He risked it all because he was a father. Because he had a daughter who was dying, who was willing to give it all up. And although Jairus held many positions in the synagogue, in the society, amongst his friends, he embraced his singular role as a father above and beyond anything he was ever given on earth. I want you to hear that. Amongst all of the positions he held in the society, in the community, in the church, he held on to his role as a father above and beyond everything else on the earth to the point he was willing to let it all go for his baby girl. The fathers of today hold many positions the fathers of today have many positions at work, maybe within the community, even within the church. And they embrace all of these positions because it provides them a sense of notoriety. It provides them a sense of acceptance, a sense of glory. But I wonder how many of our fathers would be willing to give it all up for their child to embrace their role as a father. How many of the fathers amongst us today are aware of their dying children at home. And I'm not talking about physically dying. I'm talking about spiritually dying. I'm talking about em mental, emotional, spiritual dying that our children are going through at home. That's the way our children are being attacked day in and day out, is mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and perhaps even physically. How many of our fathers are aware of it or are we so connected to the other things that we're disconnected from what is going on at home? Are we nothing more than just that lump of potato, or couch potato that just sits on the sofa and then that's it? Check in, check out. You're there in body, but you're definitely not there in mind. Man may give us many positions on the earth as men. Let me say that again. Man will give us many positions on the earth. We can hold jobs as people in work and church, community, whatever. But the one God-given position you, are, you have been given is as a father. The moment you hold your child, you understand that this position was not given to you by anyone on earth. But this was a God-given position that you were placed in. You were placed in this, this position, you were placed in this situation by God. God appointed you to be a father. Not a random chance of events. I want to say that again. God appointed you to be a father. And so with that comes an awareness of the fact that this is a God-given responsibility, a God-given mandate on your life to be a father to your child. And with that, you have to take with it a greater sense of responsibility, a greater sense of appreciation and awareness that above and beyond everything else you've been given on earth, that you will do what you can to uphold your child and your role as a father above and beyond everything else. We need to embrace this God-given position with the greatest sense of reverence, responsibility, and respect. 
Jairus did that. Jairus models that for us, that he was willing to let it all go to uphold his role as a father to his baby girl. Moving on. I want to point out the fact that Jairus came to Jesus all alone. There was not another person. It wasn't his wife. It wasn't uncles, father-in-laws, fathers. No one else but Jairus took the initiative to come before Jesus, kneel at his feet, and bring him back home. It was, the, it was his initiative. And I love the picture. I think it's in verses 41 and 42, I believe it is, is that we have this amazing picture of Jesus coming into the room of Jairus' daughter, surrounded by the three disciples who are closest to Jesus, the parents, mom and dad, and the daughter. And as they are there, we have this amazing connection, this amazing and beautiful picture of Jesus speaking over this daughter's life, awakening her up, and they establish this connection. She is healed. They witness a miracle. And I can assure you that family is never the same from that day on because of Jesus. But all of that came about because Jairus took that step, that initiative to bring Jesus into the room. And that connection between Jairus' daughter and Jesus was established when Jairus took that step as a father to connect his daughter to Jesus Christ. The second responsibility of a father is to consistently look for ways to connect their children to Jesus, to the presence of Jesus Christ. The second responsibility of a father is to consistently look for ways of connecting their child to the presence of Jesus Christ. Now that can be easier done when a child is four or five years old. We bring them into Sunday school every Sunday, law of church, kids church. We say some Bible stories, occasionally have them memorize some verses. And you know, you do what you can to, and it's so much easier then to, to do something for children. But it becomes really difficult when our child goes from being four or five to like 15 and 16, right? I don't have experience in that, but I've seen it. Uh, I've witnessed it from hearing parents and, yeah. Why I say all that is, is that as a child becomes older, he or she begins to closely watch their parents to, first of all, see if what they preach and have been teaching me is backed up with how they live, all right? That, if that isn't in conjunction with each other, then that totally creates a big disconnect between them and God, all right? Number two is, as a child becomes older, they are exposed to so much more of the world. I mean, in high school, in college, I mean, they're exposed to so much in the way of temptation, spiritual attacks, and it becomes so much more difficult to stay on track with their life, to, to really connect them with Jesus, and I know of parents who have many times just given up on their child. You know, they do what they can. They tell them to come to church on Sunday morning. They, they try to speak as much as they can. But at the end of it all, they just throw up their hands and say, he's a lost cause. Or she's hopeless. There's nothing more that I can do. I just throw up my hands and say, look, he's lost. He's hopeless. There's nothing that I can do. May God have mercy on him. That's the way it is with a lot of people as kids get older, is that they stop, they get tired of connecting their children to Jesus because they're worn out. They're tired of it. You all have heard of the name Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, by all accounts, would have been deemed as a lost cause. If you all remember back with me, he was a serial killer who raped and murdered young men and went so far as cannibalizing his victims. In February of 1992, he stood before a court and was sentenced as guilty for killing 15 people. He was sentenced to serve 15 life sentences, totaling 957 years in prison. A lost cause. Jeffrey Dahmer was eventually murdered in prison in 1994. And per perhaps you've heard that prior to his death, he became a born-again Christian. And this is what he was quoted as saying. Jeffrey Dahmer said this prior to his death. If a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? 
that's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution as truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it. There's nothing. And I've since come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God. And I believe that I, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. These are the words of a man who murdered 15 people and tortured them, cannibalized them, and was sentenced to serve 957 years in prison. By all accounts, and I'm not God, neither are you, we don't know, I mean, by all accounts, Jeffrey Dahmer became a Christian before he died. Do you know who played a pivotal role in his newfound salvation? His father. Although he was deemed as a hopeless lost cause by the entire world, to the point that even other inmates were looking to kill him, his father continually stayed in contact with his son and sent him evangelical material while he was in prison. As a result, that played a huge role in his conversion, in his transformation, in his salvation. He became a Christian. I say all this to basically point out this reality. As a father, no matter what situation or condition your son or daughter is in, you are to consistently point them to Jesus Christ. No matter if your fellow relatives or your friends have deemed them as a lost cause, we consistently work to point them to the person, to the presence of Jesus Christ. We as fathers need to serve as a bridge to gap that distance between Jesus and our child and let the Holy Spirit complete the work. Jairus' daughter, Jeffrey Dahmer. Probably you'll never hear, you've never heard them to mention in a sermon. You probably won't ever hear it again. But yet it was their fathers who played a pivotal role in them getting connected to Jesus Christ. Remember that. The last thing I want to talk about this morning um, is that fathers are called to be men of courage. Fathers are called to be men of courage. In verse 35, we read that as Jairus is, you know, they, Jesus healed that ble- the woman that was bleeding for 12 years, and I'm not going to get into that today, if, maybe at a different time, but as they're making their way back, people come to Jairus and essentially tell him, look, your daughter is dead, all right? Stop bothering Jesus any longer. Come back with us and let's start preparing for her funeral. All right? So as he hears that news, you can imagine the emotion that Jairus is feeling, the fear, the sadness, the sorrow, the anguish, piercing him like a dart. Further on in this story, as Jesus and Jairus are are back at home, and Jesus tells them, look, this daughter is not dead. She's simply sleeping. All the people laugh. They're laughing at Jesus. They're essentially laughing at Jairus. And we have this situation, this condition where, again, Jairus is confronted with people who are laughing and ridiculing him for staying connected to Jesus. Two accounts, two places where he could have cowered away in fear. And I love the way Jesus responded in both accounts. On the first account, Jesus simply gets in the face of Jairus and tells him, Do not be afraid. Simply believe. And then when they walk into the house and people are starting to laugh at Jairus, Jesus simply t- kicks them out of the house and just says, look, we're here to, to come together and, and heal this daughter. Both accounts, Jesus takes charge. As fathers, we need to learn that in order to stay as men of courage, we have to be willing to yield, surrender, submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And that is counterintuitive to our gut in the sense that we want to find ways to solve problems through our own strength, through our own vengeance or adrenaline. We, are, we as men are created to be beings that are just looking to find a way to fight, looking to find a way to re- wreak havoc on situations that are troubling us. But Jesus is saying, look, before you act impulsively, simply look to me, listen to me, follow my lead. Follow my lead. 
Imagine with me how different this story would have read if Jairus impulsively reacted in fear, if he decided to leave Jesus and go back home and bury his daughter, or if in the course of the laughter that people did in terms of laughing at him, if he succumbed to that and, and kicked Jesus out, how would the story have ended differently? How would the story have ended differently? But because Jairus determined in his heart to stay courageous, stay uh, submissive and yield himself to the leading of Christ, we find ourselves reading about a miracle here in 2012. As a father, we have to under, as fathers, we have to understand that our primary role is to Christ in terms of submitting to his lead and following his direction. And in doing that, we show our children how we handle problems, how we respond to problems. Our children are watching us. You know that. If you have kids, you know that. Our children are watching our every move. And they are taking mental notes of the very things that we do, both good and bad. And they are free to display those notes that they've taken to anybody at any given time. I know of a story of a family who had a five-year-old son, and they had a problem with gossiping. Imagine that. And so um, they gossiped about everyone, every little thing. And it was just the subject of their Sunday, Saturday, every day. That's what they did. Um, well, one of their closest friends who actually came to visit them from time to time from New York uh, popped in and here and there, and, you know, they enjoyed having them over. But on one occasion, they got um, a whim or some knowledge of the fact that this, this family's son had recently shaved his head. And been on nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that back, you know, it was a while ago, and there was just something they had to talk about. So they started making fun of their friend's son in front of their five-year-old son. And, you know, one thing led to another, and this group of friends decided to come over for a holiday from New York. They were gathered around the dinner table, and all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, this five-year-old blurts out, you know, my dad and mom think it's silly that your son shaved his head. And the you can just kind of tell the conversation just abrupt, abruptly ended. Complete silence. Pin drop silence. And needless to say, 25 years later, the family has not come back by to visit. They have not come back by to even make a phone call. And I say all that just as a way to show you that children are watching us, watching our every move, even when we don't think about it. And they are freely... I mean, like the paparazzi, they're freely able to display what they have seen at any given time. And no matter what the cost would be. And, in, and, and I say all that is to, to help us understand that even as we handle our problems in life, how we handle it, child watches what we do. Are we a man of prayer? Are we a man of courage that we would stand true to our convictions and, and take it to Jesus? Or are we people who will find out that we're impulsive, react, we just react, and we want to do things our own way. This morning, as I conclude today's message, um, I've just given you a brief overview of a few of the responsibilities of a father. Number one, a father is supposed to embrace his role as a father above and beyond everything else. Number two, a father is someone who consistently points his son or daughter or children to the person, the presence of Jesus Christ. Number three, a father is someone who is courageous, who holds to his convictions, who will surrender and submit his life to Christ in all things, no matter what the cost. But the one thing I really hope you walk away with today is a deep found or a new found respect for your role as a dad. Or if you're not a dad or you're looking to, to maybe mentor someone or be a father figure to someone, I hope it awakens your heart to the understanding that fatherhood is a God-given gift, a God-given responsibility to raise our children to follow Jesus and to ultimately help them accomplish the will for which they were created by God. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you can't relate to a single word I've said because you don't or never had, have had a father, or you've had one in body, but really not very connected with you growing up. The beautiful thing about Jesus is, is that he was the perfect representation of his Father in heaven. And many times he would say, 
that I, would, I do what my Father has called me to do. And in verse, John, John chapter 10, verse 30, he went so far as to say that I and my Father are one. So when you see me, you're essentially seeing the Father. And when we think about the life of Jesus and all the miracles that he performed and all of the way he showed compassion amongst the most unlovable people on the earth, the widows, the for forgotten people, the, you know, the sick people, and ultimately we find that that path led him to the cross. And we get a gr just a glimpse of how powerful the Father's love is for us and that he did not spare his only son and that he did not even, Jesus himself did not withheld even a single drop of his sweat or his blood or his breath as he hung off the cross, all in a public display of affection to all of mankind, to all of those among us who are fatherless. So I tell you here this morning, if you have gone through life and you did not have someone on earth to call you, to call dad, I want you to know that for not even for a second did you go through this earth without having a father. You did not tread a single step on this earth without being called son. That there was a father in heaven and there is a father in heaven who proudly calls you his son or his daughter. All you need to do is acknowledge that reality and that truth. Acknowledge it. And, and if it helps, I take you back just to the cross. Because at the cross, you find perfect provision. You find perfect sacrifice. You find perfect protection. You find perfect love. It's at the cross. If you would just take a moment to glimpse what he did for you on the cross, you find what it means to be a son or a daughter. When you see your Savior displaying what it means to be the Son of God, displaying what the Father's love is, you find it full well. So I encourage you to take some, just take a moment to hear your Father's voice over you. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you and praise you for blessing us with your presence today. I want to thank you and praise you, God, that for many among us here, you have privileged them to be called a dad. For many among us here today, there are many men who are around children who can serve as a, as a father figure to the kids around them. I thank you for them. I thank you, God, that you've blessed them for, with such a position. I, I simply ask that you continue to bless them with a renewed perspective and a vision that what they hold is not a position given to them by man, but it is given to them by you. That they would surrender all they have to uphold and honor this God-given position. Father, I do pray that you would bless them to be a constant, consistent reminder to the children around them of who Jesus is. And that no matter where they're at in life, they would consistently, faithfully point their children to you. And I know that in the midst of a culture and a society where it's okay to be, to, to be reckless, it's okay to, to do things that make you happy, I pray that in the midst of all of those lies that these men would be men of courage who would hold on to their convictions and ultimately surrender themselves to you with everything and be amazing examples of what it is to be godly men to the children in their lives. And ultimately, God, we just thank you that no matter where we've been in, in the past, no matter if we've had a father or not, that you, are, our God, has been our consistent father, that we can't ever claim that there was a day where we were fatherless, but yet through Jesus, we have the perfect understanding that we are loved like no other. We are loved in such an amazing way that you sent your one and only son to die for us on the cross. And in that, we find perfect, perfect love. We thank you, sweet Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.